What's up guys? Today we're going over some emergent conditions. As I kind of mentioned before, these are conditions that essentially warrant an emergency action plan. Either you're calling 911, you're doing something to intervene with the patient to help them. These are conditions that are, remember the boards, the safety test. These are the conditions that are testing your safety abilities and everything to keep your patients safe from dying. Now this is part one. I will release part two later. Um, but as of right now, it's just part one because there, <laughs> there's a ton of emergent conditions. I want to make sure each one gets the necessary care and explanation so that we're not just breezing through all 20 or so emergent conditions in one go. So we're just going to go over eight today. So the first thing I want to go over is a laceration. So any sort of cut, external bleed, this could be a superficial laceration, like a paper cut could be deep that something's like blood squirting out of it. So not good at all. So what does a laceration look like? So essentially what I'm going to do with this presentation, I'm going to say, what does it look like? And then what do we do? So how do we recognize a laceration? We're seeing that if it's an arterial laceration, that it's going to be bright blood, bright red. It could be pulsing out, maybe even squirting if it's really bad. And this will indicate a deep laceration. So um, remember our arteries are located deeper than the veins The veins are more superficial to allow for heat exchange and stuff like that. The arterial blood is more deep. The arteries are more deep. And so that's, they're be more protected by all the subcutaneous tissue because remember arteries have pulses, which means that if we're squirting out blood, we're losing more blood. So bad, very bad if it's an arterial laceration. Now, if we see a venous laceration, that means that a vein is cut. And this would be more of a dark red, purplish kind of color. It'll kind of seep and ooze out of the body. So this would be more superficial cut. Uh, and this could uh, be just one that we just need to apply pressure to and then we're okay. Um, again, big, large lacerations are really bad. And that's when we call number one. So what are we doing in this situation? So we're going to call EMS, 911, emergency services, whatever. Um, if there is one, a severe blood coming out of the wound, like a, like a lot of blood coming out of the wound. Um, if blood is spurting out or squirting out or whatever words the boards decides to use, like you see like in those uh, movies, like somebody gets stabbed in the leg, it's like squirting out kind of thing. If that's happening, very bad. Um, we're calling 911 because that's an arterial deep laceration. Or if we have been applying pressure to the wound for more than 10 minutes and it's still bleeding, that makes the patient more at risk for bleeding out. So we want to make sure that we are um, covering that wound and then also calling 911 because we do not want the patient to die from blood loss. So again, with a lot of these emergent conditions, I want you guys to keep one thing in mind. Well, two things in mind. Um, number one is we only want one person's hurt right now. We only want, we want to keep it at one person hurt. We do not want ourselves to become injured, contaminated, like infected, hurt, like anything at all. We want, we got one person in, pro, in trouble. We want to keep it to just one. Uh, ideally we'd want zero, but if there's one person in trouble, we, we don't want it to be two or three. So put gloves on when we're dealing with a laceration that's to protect yourself from blood, uh, transmitted infections. And so we do not want those things being transmitted and, uh, causing us to be hurt later on or, uh, have like an infection later on because we are just trying to help somebody. So when we are applying pressure to the laceration, we want to use a sterile towel or any sort of gauze or something along those lines. We want to make sure that, um, it's not going to infect the wound further because we are coming in direct contact with the patient's blood. We don't want any bloodborne illnesses to um, kind of go. So here's the kind of thing right now when it comes to tourniquets, guys. Right now at the time, this is April, 2022. The board is still anti-tourniquet, but here's what's been going on when it comes to the uh, American Red Cross, all of the first aid certifying people in the world. Uh, the literature has kind of started to support and all the data has supported that we kind of should be going back to pro tourniquet. So for the boards, as of right now, April, 2022, I'll let you know when the update happens in uh, 2023. Um, the boards is don't use the boards will to ask you to not use a tourniquet. If in real life you have somebody who is bleeding out, it's better to use a tourniquet rather than just let them bleed out because you've been told not to use one. So right now, first aid is saying that. So follow what whatever first aid you've learned. Boards right now is being weird about it and being like no. So when they are, when the boards eventually goes back to allowing tourniquets, you're gonna put that proximal to the wound to avoid uh, blood spurting out. So that's what's going on with lacerations with that. And I will update this PowerPoint once that changes.
heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. Um, so understanding that these are heat illnesses, problems with overheating the patient. So core body temperature has risen to dangerous levels. So let's kind of define what's the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So heat stroke is worse than heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion will happen before heat stroke. So heat exhaustion is something that probably a lot of us have experienced at some point on a really hot day. Maybe we played soccer in the middle of August or something like that and we're dying. Maybe we just went to Florida for five minutes or something like that. Like this is, this is what happens. And so heat exhaustion, you would see profuse sweating. So really bad diaphoresis. The words might use that word. You'll see pale skin, it's moist, and um, and they'll use the word moist. Guys, so sorry if you don't like that word. That's what the word's going to use. So um, you have that really pallor kind of discoloration. The patient, and that's the important thing. The patient's like skin is still wet and moist. Like when it comes to heat stroke, it's they stop sweating, and that's how you know that it's a real bad problem. Uh, they'll have dizziness, headache, like muscle cramps, shallow, rapid breathing, weakness, and then a weak and rapid pulse. So what's happening with heat exhaustion is essentially like you're getting really hot, getting kind of dizzy, lightheaded and you're getting those muscle cramps and stuff like that. You're looking, you're just not looking too good. You're getting you're really sweaty, stuff like that. Um, with heat stroke, on the other hand, the important thing that we see is the skin becomes dry and they stop sweating. So what does sweat do guys? Sweat is going to decrease our body temperature by pulling heat out of our skin through, the, through evaporation. If that stops, that means that the body is trying to conserve as much water as possible. And that means that we're in a really bad situation because if we're not cooling ourselves off from the uh, outside, our core body temperature is going to increase a lot. So we're going to see the nausea. They're going to have um, a short, rapid pulse kind of thing. That should say short, not strop. <laughs> um, you're going to see that they have increased core temperature. That's the big scary thing. The uh, number that is uh, used to indicate an elevated core temperature that's like severe is that 104 or higher. So we note that with like fevers and stuff like that, if the patient's uh, body temperature is over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, that we're seeing that this is going to be really, really bad because then we're seeing brain damage and all of those sort of things, so just bad. Um, again, with that brain damage, you could see like loss of consciousness, confusion. Um, they're kind of, they'll have the headache as well. Um, and then you'll see this stuff like contraction and dilation of their pupils. That's really indicating that there's a lot of problems with that. And then that labored breathing, flushed color, like they don't look good at all. And the big thing of heat stroke, again, guys, the sweating will stop when we get to the point of heat stroke. Heat stroke, it's bad, really, really bad. So what are we doing? For both of these patients, regardless if they're in heat stroke or heat exhaustion, number one thing is we're getting them into the shade and we're monitoring vital signs. We're gonna remove the outer layer of clothing to help cool them off. We're gonna put ice packs either on the back of the neck, the forehead, and the groin, because those are areas that are going to decrease body temperature the quickest if we put something cold on there, because that's where you have a lot of sweat glands. And um, this is what's going to help kind of cool the whole core temperature body down. So the important thing is when it comes to hydrating this patient, you want to give them a drink with electrolytes, no salt tablets or anything, just get them a drink with electrolytes. If it's just water, and that's all you got. That's okay. The thing is we want to make sure we're giving them room temperature water. If we give them ice cold water, it's going to shock their system. They're going to be really like sick and it's just going to make things worse. It's going to make their core temperature increase too much. So you want to give them room temperature water slowly. Don't let them chug it. They're just going to throw it up and get dehydrated slow. Now, if the patient's experiencing heat exhaustion, you're going to do all of these steps and you're just going to monitor them. If it starts getting worse, then you're calling 911. But with this patient, you're really just monitoring their vital signs when it comes to heat exhaustion, kind of just getting them from looking really bad to kind of back to okay sort of thing. And whatever they were doing afterwards, they were like running in a game or a race or something. They're, they're done for the day. They're going home. Um, heat stroke, on the other hand, if you notice that a patient has all these signs of heat stroke, remembering the sweating stops, we're calling 911. This is bad. This is a big medical emergency. Next, we have the opposite end of the spectrum, which is hypothermia and frostbite. So what does this look like? Biggest thing is we see shivering. If a patient is really like cold and they stop shivering, that's like, they're like literally dying. So, um, we want to make sure our patient is shivering hypothermia and is just the condition of having a low body temperature. Um, frostbite is where the, um, 
tissues are dying and kind of becoming gangrenous and falling off. So uh, with this, you're going to see the patient's going to be shivering. They're going to have really difficulty speaking, slurred speech kind of thing. They're going to be confused. They'll be a little drowsy, like sleepy kind of thing. They might even lose consciousness. They might not remember where they've been. Like you're kind of trying to ask them questions about themselves. They don't know where they are, what's going on, uh, the memory loss. You're going to see their heart rate and blood pressure are dropping because they're trying to conserve as much energy as possible in the core. Um, you're going to see they're, just, they're really lethargic, exhausted and they're going to be very slow with their motor responses like just because they're really trying to conserve all that energy so they're to maintaining their core temperature so what are we doing we're immediately getting this person into a warm environment getting them dry clothes a lot of times people get hypothermic because they're uh they got wet and they're outside in the cold um you're going to warm the patient up from the core to the extremities so start with like warm kind of compresses on their chest and then uh, into the extremities. If you're using any warm water on the extremities, make sure it's just lukewarm water. Um, do not use hot water. It'll shock the system and it could cause vasospasms in the hands that are going to be extremely painful. And the patient's literally going to be like, I need to go back outside into the cold because it'll hurt so much. So don't do that. It could also put the patient at risk of losing perfusion to the tissues. So the thing that we have when we call 911 is if the core body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit, or if we see any frostbite on the body, if we see any indication of gangrenous tissue, black, like charry looking kind of tissue, if their toes are falling off or something like that, we're definitely calling 911. And here's another thing, just like post hypothermia stuff uh, that the boards cares about is that massage is contraindicated for anybody who's had hypothermia or a frostbite kind of thing at least acute hypothermia, or if they have presentations of frostbite. So we would try to massage those areas that are frostbite and the toes and stuff might fall off. And you might have a toe fall off eventually in your career. You might have a toe fall off. So moving on to the next one, stroke. So this is like the big one. I know if you haven't seen it already, watch my video on a uh, cerebrovascular accidents, kind of talk about this as well. Um, so what does it look like? I like the term fast. Uh, I know it's changed to the be fast. Um, but, uh, I feel like a fast always stuck with me, but I have the B fast over here as well. So, um, the, I'll go, just go through the B and the E. So the B stands for balance. They're going to lose, uh, like they're going to lose their balance. They're going to be, have these headaches and dizziness and loss of consciousness, stuff like that. Confusion sort of thing. That's what we're seeing with that. Uh, vision changes is the I. So the E, the E and B fast, that would be, they have these like blurred vision, diplopia so double vision, stuff like that. Just problems along that line, just bad, not good. Um, the F stands for face. So this is the, one of the important ones that we see, we see that one side of their face starts drooping down. They might start slurring their words and stuff like that because it's drooping, drooling kind of thing going on with the face really not good. So they'll have numbness and drooping on that one side of the face. Now arms where you say, Hey man, lift both your arms up as if you're going to do like a bilateral muscle, manual muscle chest. And you'll see that one arm like doesn't really move much or like, isn't really moving at all. And they're like, Oh, I'm really trying to lift up both my arms. You're like, Oh no. So then that kind of indicates that there's arm weakness and stuff like that which is kind of where we have problems with our motor coordination and motor weakness and stuff. And that's indicating problems way up top. Cause remember the infarction will be on the opposite side. So like if it's a left-sided, the right side of the body is going to be weak. So don't forget about that. The speech stands for slur, slur wow, slurred speech. Gosh, <laughs> I'm like really playing the part here, guys. So S stands for speech, slurred speech drooling, all of that stuff kind of goes hand in hand with face sort of thing, but you'll see that they'll have difficulty speaking. Um, that's how I our face is not working. So they'll kind of sound something like that, or they'll just start not making any sense at all. And then you're like, oh no, not good. Um, time is the T in the B fast. And that stands for time. How long is the stroke lasting? Um, and like, you need to make sure when the stroke is happening that you're calling uh, EMS services immediately. Any sort of thing that either looks like a stroke, seems like a stroke, we're calling 911. So that's what's going on with that. Um, and then understand that, uh, so making sure what we're doing in the situation, we're calling EMS the second that we see any sort of strokes symptoms because time is of the most important. If we can get to the, the patient to the hospital and get emergency services involved as soon as possible, we can get them a quick CT scan and see if it's uh, going to be a brain bleed stroke. Because remember, there's the two types of strokes. There's the hem hemorrhagic stroke, and then there's the ischemic stroke. If it's an ischemic stroke, which stroke, which is most types of strokes, we can get the patient TPA. 
which is uh, can only be administered within three hours of a stroke happening, and that will help break up um, the clot and it will help the patient um, recover faster from their stroke. I've seen it happen with a patient who had TPA administered to them immediately after they started having a stroke, um, and she came in like two days later to therapy just because she had a knee replacement. It was crazy, and that stuff really works, really helps improve the quality of life, really great. Um, intervention. So make sure we're getting them to the hospital quickly. Here's also some of the things. Um, if we see that just the face is drooping, again, we're still calling 911, but understand that this could be a differential diagnosis of an exacerbation of myasthenia gravis, which would mean it resolves very quickly with rest with myasthenia gravis could be Bell's palsy. And so Bell's palsy is where like the facial nerve is paralyzed on one half of the face. So just kind of understand that those are differential diagnoses that we kind of have to be aware of, but um, always call EMS if it looks like a stroke, always call EMS. If the stroke lasts less than 24 hours, it is called a transient ischemic attack. I will say that again, if a stroke lasts less than 24 hours, it was called a transient ischemic attack. You're still calling 911, even if the symptoms resolve very serious. I've seen this happen in person. It's very scary, very scary. The individual is okay. Um, but it's weird. They look like they're having a stroke for like five minutes and then they were fine. It was the scariest thing, but I'm glad he was okay. So very, very, very serious. So calling 911 stuff, any sort of thing that looks like a stroke called 911, uh, shock. So what's going on with this? This is essentially something has happened to this person. Either they're injured their arm <laughs> their arms were cut off, their legs were cut off, something along those lines that we're seeing happen with this patient that causes them to go into shock. So this is just a state of being that's just, you really don't look good. You kind of know when someone's in shock. So symptoms will include diaphoresis, so excessive sweating, pallor, the cool and moist skin, um, decrease in body temp. So that's why we would see it being more cold rather than warmed moist skin. Um, we'll see hypotension. So their BPs, their BPs tanking with this one. They're really tanking. A lot of times it's because they're uh, having excessive blood loss. So kind of go back to the laceration kind of thing. Somebody could have a laceration and be in shock. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing with this patient. Nausea and vomiting. So they're, they're really not doing well. Um, they're super dizzy. They're confused. Uh, they can have a lot of anxiety about the situation. Their heart might be pumping through, uh, pumping like crazy. Um, or, uh, then it's like weak. It's like not like a strong pulse or anything like that. They could have a loss of consciousness or syncope. So a lot of times when they go into shock, they're going to pass out because their brain's like, you know what, I'm going to peace out right now. Um, this is a lot right now. Um, this is kind of, I actually, today I was treating a patient and his leg was crushed. And he said there was about this much space left in his leg and he was scooting back trying to he got crushed by something scooting back and he said he just sees blood everywhere and he just like he's like he's like i guess i just passed out because i was like i'm done with this and yeah that's kind of what's going on with shock so what are we doing first we're removing the source of the shock whatever it is if it's they were in a situation where they were running or whatnot and they're not doing too good we get them out of that situation whatever it is if they are in shock because they had, I don't know, something, we're removing it now. Here's something else about lacerations that I want to tell you guys. Uh, if the person is lacerated and the object is still in them, do not remove it. Um, it's probably blocking blood flow, so do not remove that. So if it's they're in shock because somebody stabbed them, you leave the thing in. This is the one disclaimer. You leave it in there. The boards isn't going to really ask you about that, uh, but this is just for everybody else's um knowledge. So um, the main thing that we're going to be worried about when we see a patient who's going through shock is we're going to monitor vitals. If they become uh, unconscious, lose their pulse rate, because remember they have that weak and rapid pulse, um, we're going to be calling 911. Uh, if they're needing to be resuscitated with CPR, that should say CPR, not CRP. So with CPR and stuff like that. Um, and again, if the patient is injured, loses consciousness, or requires CPR, that's when we call 911. Um, if they're still conscious, we're going to elevate the feet above their head as long as there's no spinal involvement. So if the patient is suffering from a spinal cord injury, we do not touch spinal cord patients. We leave them exactly where they are. We do not move them because they're going to need to be backboarded and maintained in a straight position. So we don't exacerbate the extent of the spinal cord injury. Um, we're going to put a cold compress to the forehead if they are in shock because they're overheated, or we're going to put a blanket on them to keep them warm. I'm sure you've seen after like some of these races, people have like the, the shiny blanket wrapped around them. That's kind of like something we would use. Um, and then a regular blanket as well. So that's kind of what's going on when someone goes into shock. 
diabetic emergency, this is 100% going to show up on the board. So if you kind of uh, zone out for a little bit, this is my get back into this. This is, this is important. <laughs> so diabetic emergency is either they become hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. So let's kind of talk about this. And this can happen with both type one and type two diabetics. So hypoglycemia, these are some important things that you would notice when it comes to uh, signs and symptoms, because they're going to ask you about the difference between the two. So you're going to see pallor. So that whiteness of the skin, um, you're going to see have moist skin with the hypo glycemia. So that's a low blood sugar below 70 glucose. You're going to see they're going to have more shallow breathing. They'll have the dizziness, headache, hunger. So like, think about like, if you worked out on an empty stomach afterwards, how you were feeling, like you really are like not, you're hungry, got a headache. You're kind of really over it. You're a little dizzy, shallow breathing. That's kind of what's going on with this. Um, they're going to be kind of, they're going to be confused. They're going to have what's called giddiness. That's just like excited and uh, all over the place kind of thing. Um, they just don't seem like themselves, personality changes, rapid heart rate, seizures. And unfortunately we're seeing a loss of consciousness with this person or any sort of seizures. That's where we're calling 911. Um, and that's what the blood glucose less than 70. Now hyperglycemia, on the other hand, this is one that's really dangerous because it could lead to something called diabetic ketoacidosis. And so this is where you have very high, high, high blood sugar. I'm talking like 500 plus. Um, this is really bad. This is a very big medical emergency. We do not want this patient um, having lots of problems. And so uh, with that, you will notice the ketoacidosis, the polyuria. So that's frequent, frequent urination, polyphagia. That is frequent, like excessive thirst kind of thing. Um, glucose urea, that is um, gl uh, glucose in the urine. So glucose urea fruity smelling breath. This is the big one. That's like very straightforward hyperglycemia. The boards will throw you a freebie on this and say the fruity smelling breath or acetone smelling breath. That's uh, for hyper uh, nausea and vomiting, dry tongue, and then labored breathing. So this person, like the person who's hypoglycemic, they just really like, don't look good. The person who's hyperglycemic, they just seem like questionable and they have the fruity breath and they're peeing and drinking a lot of water. That's kind of what we're seeing a lot. So what do you do? What do we do? This is important guys. If they're hypo, so hypo is low. If they are low hypo, you're going to give them sugar because we need to bring that blood sugar up. So the big thing that we're going to do is just say orange juice. That's like the standard one, honestly, applesauce, anything with sugar in it. Um, apple juice, thinking about my cousin's a type one diabetic. I'm like thinking of everything in her like arsenal of things. Sometimes she just takes a glucose tablet. She's like, I'm so sick of orange juice. I'm over it. Um, so any sort of glucose, get it in them. If the patient's unconscious, um, we're calling 911. If it's like out in the clinic or something like that, and your, your kid that you're treating has type one diabetes and just passes out, um, we're calling 911. And if we're in a hospital setting, the nursing staff will administer glucose injections intravenously um, to get it straight into the bloodstream to help increase that uh, uh, blood sugar. So um, hyperglycemia, on the other hand, this is if the patient's in ketoacidosis, and you'll know this because the blood sugar is like super high or they're like kind of starting to pass out and stuff like that. Um, call 911. Generally, if your diabetic patient is not conscious, call 911. Generally, if anyone's not conscious, call 911. Uh, but you're going to call 911 and the, ask the patient if they're able to, to inject themselves with insulin. All diabetics know how to do this unless they are like paralyzed or something. Like all diabetics know how to inject themselves with insulin. It's like diabetes day one, one-on-one kind of thing. So you're going to ask them to do that. You technically cannot do that. Um, do not under any circumstances give a hyperglycemic patient sugar. The hyperglycemic patient needs insulin. Insulin brings the blood glucose down. If you give somebody who's already over the moon with their blood sugar, more sugar, it's just going to make it worse. So hyperglycemic insulin, hypoglycemic sugar. That's the big things for that. Pulmonary embolism, guys, this is a big thing that we're going to possibly see in somebody who's had a previous surgery. So that's one of the things that you got to be careful about because a pulmonary embolism is an embolus. So some sort of like thrombus blood clot that's lodged into the lungs. So bad, definitely not good. So what does it look like? The biggest hallmark sign is you're going to see something called hemoptysis, and that is going to be coughing up blood. So hemo being blood, tysis, so that's P, 
T-Y-S-I-S that is indicated of coughing. So you're going to see that with this patient. Shortness of breath is a big one. Chest pain, tachypnea, rapid heart rate, fever. They're going to be very sweaty. So diaphoresis, cyanosis, and then swelling in the leg and cramping. That would be indicative of a DVT. And the DVT is what's causing the pulmonary embolism, abbreviated PE. So big things, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, cyanosis. If they're turning blue in general, it's really bad. Um, what are we doing? This is an immediate medical emergency. This is like, I call 911 immediately and I am going to monitor this patient until EMS arrives. And I will probably be doing CPR in the next like five minutes. Um, so a pulmonary embolism is something that can kill you very quickly. Um, we are making sure that we're getting this person medical attention immediately. Treatment for this would be heparin. Burns, guys. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do when it comes to a burn, if we're, we're going to identify what kind of burn is it? Is it a thermal, aka heat burn? Is it an electrical burn? Is it a chemical burn? And we're going to remove whatever the source of the burn is. Burns can be identified as superficial, going just through the epidermis, partial thickness, which will go through parts of the dermis, and then a full thickness would go all the way down into the subcutaneous tissue. Think of burn staging the similar way to like pressure ulcer staging. It kind of makes everything easier to remember that way. So what do we do if we see a burn? First of all, we're going to remove the source of the burn. Let's say it's a thermal burn. They were near something hot. We get them away from that. Say they were in the sun. They got a really bad sunburn. We get them out of the sun. Uh, if it's a chemical, we're going to flush the chemical out. So like think of like your chem lab, how you had all those like weird chemicals. They're like, do not touch the chemicals or you're going to have your skin eaten away by the acid. Yeah, it was really bad. Don't do that. You're going to run it under water. And you're going to make sure you flush all of the uh, chemical out. You want to make sure you're flushing the burn out in a way that's not going to get the chemical on the rest of your skin. You're going to want to just get it out as quickly as possible. So you want to run the water off the body. Um, if it's a thermal burn, let's say that the patient was, um, for some reason, decided to stick their hand in the hydroculator. Or maybe this is you sticking your hand in the hydroculator thinking like, yeah, I can do this. Like I can just grab it without the tongs. And um, then you get like kind of a thermal burn on your like fingers or something. Run it under cool, not hot water for several minutes. If it's like a finger, hand, foot, something like that, that's like small. If it's large parts of the body, that's why we're kind of having concerns that we might be calling EMS services. If it's an electrical burn, and this is important, the broads is going to quiz you on what's the thing going on with electrical burns different than other burns. With electrical burns, what thing in our body requires electricity to work? Old ticker there, the heart. So we're going to see some arrhythmias when it comes to uh, electrical burn. So be very, very, very careful when it comes to that. Um, remove. So make sure we're assessing the vital signs and heart rhythms when it comes to an electrical burn. So we're going to remove any clothing near the burn. Sometimes if it's a really bad burn, like a fire kind of burn, like, I don't know, let's, I don't know what would happen. Like one of the, like a gas leak and explodes or something crazy like that in the clinic, something crazy could happen. I don't know. Like people have emergencies in the clinic all the time. So um, sometimes the clothes will become part of the burn. So in that case, you kind of just step back, let it be. Um, and so you're going to call emergency services if there is either burns to the perineum, the perineum the private parts, anything like that. If the groin, anus, all of that stuff. And we're seeing burns there. We're calling them one. It's really bad. Face, very bad because then it runs a risk of like inhalation, smoke inhalation, all of that stuff. Very bad. That respiratory involvement, not good. Um, and so respiratory involvement as well would be another reason why we would call EMS services or if there's extensive burns. So I know we talked about the rule of nines. Guys, make sure you know the rule of nines. <laughs> if you're not caught up on that, there will be a rule of nines question. I can just guarantee that because they're like, Ooh, math, let's make it hard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, take, make sure you pay attention to that. If there's extensive burns, then we're seeing that we got to get EMS involved. And I know like if there's 33% of the body burned or not, they're going to be hospitalized for a long time. So we got to be careful when it comes to that. That's when we would call 911. All right, guys, we made it to the sample question today. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient recently discharged from the hospital following a total knee arthroscopy. The patient is completing a sit to stand transfer when the patient suddenly collapses back into the chair and begins coughing and becomes diaphoretic. Upon investigation, the patient's sputum is sanguinous. What should the therapist do next? One, administer Plavix. Two, take vital signs. Three, call EMS services or four, bring the patient a cool towel for their head. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this.
All right, guys, so our answer is to call EMS services immediately. So if we didn't see what exactly this is called. We didn't, I didn't tell you what the name of this condition was, um, but from looking at our keywords here, patient, first thing we see is they recently had a surgery, total knee arth arthroscopy. So that's not like a major, major surgery, like an arthroplasty. We're just kind of going in there, but it's still surgery. So we got to be careful because any sort of surgery, we run the risk of clots. Patients doing some exercise, do to do, and they suddenly collapse and begin coughing. Okay, not good. And they become diaphoretic. Okay, well, I was saying they're coughing and they're sweating. I'm like, okay, like, did you like choke on your spit or something like that? And then we see that their spit is like bloody uh, and they're coughing up blood. So that's the hemoptysis, guys. So understanding sanguinous, sanguinous sputum is going to be indicative of just red blood. Remember sanguinous is just blood. Um, so we're seeing like, oh crap, they're coughing up blood essentially. So that would be a pulmonary embolism. Remember anytime pulmonary embolism happens immediately call 911. Plavix is going to be um, one of our uh, antiplatelet drugs or anticoagulant drugs. I totally forgot which one, sorry guys, but um, that's not going to uh, fix the problem essentially. Um, this is going to uh, not going to fix our problem. And so that is, we're not doing that and we're not allowed to administer medication. Um, taking vital signs. Okay, that'll be good with this patient after we call 911. And then bringing the patient a cool towel for their head. I mean, that might help to keep them comfortable and stuff, but the main thing we're seeing is this patient's coughing up blood and they had a recent surgery. We're thinking they probably have a pulmonary embolism going on. We're suspecting that. We're calling EMS right now. All right, guys, this was very long, but lots of conditions that are going to show up on the boards. Um, remember, the boards is a safety test. They don't care how great of a clinician you are and how cool you are with your patients. They care if you're not going to kill somebody. So hope that this was helpful and I will see y'all on the next one. Take care, everybody.